invite you to take a moment just to greet those who are around you, and we'll welcome those who are joining us online as we begin our time of worship together. When we come together in worship, we light a candle. The candle reminds us of the light of Christ, which shines in our midst, shines in the virtual space between us, and shines in our hearts. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God is at work in all. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come into our place of worship this day. Come into each heart, each prayer, each song, each life here today so that we may live and love with purpose, courage, and enthusiasm, serving our world. Amen. Our opening hymn found in Voices United at number 375, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness. Yeah. 
Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kathy Campbell, and I am here as a member of the Affirming Working Group of the Trinity United Church. Today is Pride Sunday, and we, along with other United Churches across Canada, mark this day, the first Sunday in June, to celebrate the lives and ministry of LGBTQIA and Two-Spirit people in all their diversity. So during our learning time today as an affirming congregation, we're going to kick off Pride Month and show our pie by being public, intentional, and explicit. What is Pride Month, or Le Mois de Fierté, all about? It's kind of got two parts. Pride is a positive stance against discrimination and violence toward lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and gender fluid people, but it's also an opportunity to promote self-affirmation dignity, equality, and fundamental human rights, and to celebrate in a safe environment. Did you know that Canada Census in 2021, for the first time, included gender identification questions? The phrase, at birth, was added to the question about sex on the questionnaire. Under gender, those filling out the census were given the option to write their own third option instead of male or female. This question helped provide insight into an important information gap on gender diversity in the country. Gender diversity was highest among those aged 20 to 24, almost one in 100 of whom were transgender or non-binary, so about 1% in that age group. These numbers most likely underestimate the true size of the country's trans and non-binary populations, as older people are less likely to feel comfortable disclosing their gender. Younger generations may be more comfortable reporting their gender identity because the acceptance and understanding of gender and sexual diversity has evolved, and there has also been social and legislative recognition of transgender, non-binary, and LGBTQ2 people in general. Specifically, in Alberta, we have the fourth highest number of these residents in the country, and Lethbridge has the highest proportion of transgender and non-binary people among all Alberta communities. So what does non-binary and transgender mean? Before I address these terms, a note about language. Language has power and constantly changes. For example, the acronym LGBTQ has evolved to a variety of forms, and the one I use is 2S LGBTQIA+, as we learn more and expand our inclusivity. So without getting into too much detail, here is some vocabulary I hope you find helpful this morning. 
So non-binary, just to let you know, this is the non-binary flag. So if you ever see this, this represents people who do not identify as man or woman. For some, their gender may feel like a combination of man and woman. Others may feel as though they do not identify with any gender at all. Trans or transgender. This is the flag for trans and transgender people. This describes a person who has a gender identity that is different from the gender they were assigned at birth. And some, the process of transgender individual who publicly changes their gender at presentation society is known as transitioning. Transgender people may choose from a range of changes to express their gender. And there's three options that I learned about, or three choices. Change of your name and pronouns. Change in expression, clothing, jewelry, makeup, mannerisms, vocabulary, and anatomy and physiology, which can include hormones, surgery, or gender confirming surgery. For example, male to female or female to male. The journey of transition is unique to each individual. Not everyone who considers themselves transgender will undergo all of the changes listed here. So how can we be allies? I went to EGAL Canada, which is the leading organization for 2S LGBTQI people and issues. They improve lives through research, education, awareness, and legal advocacy. First of all, allyship is a verb. It's a continuous practice of doing the work of standing up for marginalized people. So here's some ideas. The first, thir first thing we can do is learn, which is what we as a congregation at Trinity have been doing over the past few years. Listen to and respect the experiences and perspectives of, of 2S LGBTQI people. Look for opportunities to expand your understanding. And remember that learning is your responsibility. Avoid asking 2S LGBTQI people to answer all of your questions. And during the month of Pride, I'd recommend looking for activities that are happening around, in and around the Edmonton area. There's a lot happening and opportunities to learn. The next thing is to practice. Intervene when you witness offensive behavior or language. Use inclusive language to ensure that we all feel welcome and respective. Everyone makes mistakes as an ally. So if an error is brought to your attention, apologize regardless of your intent. And then reflect. Be open to feedback and think critically about how your behavior or actions might impact other people. Always assume that 2S LGBTQI people or their loved ones are in the room. Consider how they might be impacted by the tone, spirit, and direction of the conversations you are having. Remember, everyone's experience of gender and sexuality is different, and it's impossible and unfair to ask one person to speak out on behalf of the entire identity group. Listen for and politely ask what pro pronouns to use. So on that note, this is one of the easiest things I think we can do. Um, so to highlight, I'm going to highlight gender neutral pronouns. You can't always know what someone's gender pronoun is by looking at them. Discussing and correctly using gender pronouns sets a tone of respect and allyship and can truly make all the difference by affirming self-identification and self-expression. Commonly used gender neutral pronouns are they, them, and theirs. For example, if you were if it were appropriate to ask somebody, do you have a wife? Do you have a husband? And what is his or her name? We can adjust the question to be, do you have a partner? And what is their name? The use of pronouns are becoming more normalized and we see it now in email signatures, profiles on social media, in Zoom meetings, uh, meeting introductions, for example, hi, my name's Kathy, and I use the pronouns she and her, and just start a meeting that way. And you can also ask, what pronouns would you like us to use? The United Church affirms that gender and sexuality are gifts of God, and that all persons are made in the image of God. The United Church is opposed to discrimination against any person on any basis by which a person is devalued. Trinity's affirming vision statement begins with, 
This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15, 12. So let's take action to be intentionally inclusive, compassionate and kind, even if we don't understand. So we create a place where everyone belongs. Pride Month is a time to publicly celebrate the rainbow people of God. Let's practice the rainbow of colors in our lives, in the conversations and interactions in our lives at church, at home, at work, and at play, as we go out into our community and in the world to share the message that God's love is for everyone. Thank you, Kathy. And let us join together singing, Spirit of Life, Come Unto Me, and it's found in Voices United at 381, and the words are projected as well. A reading from the Hebrew Bible, book of Genesis, beginning at chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Sinar and settled there. And they had said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose will do now will be impossible for them. Let us go down and confuse their, their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This ends the first reading. The second reading is from the Book of Acts of the Apostles, beginning at chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
dividing tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And as the sound of the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each, amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Pantheans, Medes, Elamites, and res residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will pro pro prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is part of our sacred story. Thanks be to God. Today is Pentecost Sunday. This is the celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit to the apostles and other followers of Christ who at that time were gathered in Jerusalem. We hear the story in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Fifty days after the Passover, Pentecost relates to 50, 50 days after the Passover, there was a celebration day called Pentecost. So it was a day when people gathered and worshipped and were together. When we remember this dramatic story, there are several elements of it that come to mind. There was wind to begin with. There was the sound like the rush of a violent wind that filled the house where they were gathered. And we talk about the Holy Spirit being like wind. It blows where it will. We cannot see it, yet we can feel it and we can see what it moves. We can also draw on this idea of wind to think of it as the breath of life. Breath being part of wind. So the Holy Spirit then is like breath and breeze and blowing wind in our lives and in our church. And then we talk about fire. 
tongues of fire appeared among them and rested on each of them. Fire can be welcome or it can be feared. Fire can warm us when we're cold, but fire is something that does not want to be controlled, and it can burn everything in its path. Fire is also used to burn away impurities in some substances. Fire will take away the chaff and the trash. The Holy Spirit is like fire, and we cannot expect to control what the Spirit can do or will do. The third element that comes to mind in the story and the celebration of Pentecost is language. When these apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit, as it says, they began to speak in other languages. And in Jerusalem at that time, because this was a special celebration, there were people from all over the vast region of the world that they knew. It was listed all the places that people had come from. They were people of different cultures and different languages, and they were able to understand. I want to think about language today as we celebrate the moving and energizing and clarifying work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our churches. The Pentecost story in the book of Acts is one important story in the Bible about language. Another important story from the, from the scriptures is in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, or the Hebrew scriptures. It's the story of the building and then the frustration of the Tower of Babel, or Babel. I always remember Babel, but Babel sounds like the word that we know in English. We hear the story that everyone was the same at one time. They all had one culture, and they had one language, and they thought that they could do anything. God's intention for the people was different. Humans were not intended to be stuck in one place and everyone the same. So that plan was frustrated. And they were scattered over all the earth. So the people would learn about the world and the people would see different things and they would experience life in different ways. People would then express their thoughts and their experiences in different ways. So cultures became different. Languages became different. And let us assume now that is a good thing. Language is a living issue these days. There are, of course, languages worldwide that have a great deal of strength and stress. We might call them dominant languages. There are also languages that have less stress, and those who are speakers of those languages encourage the use of that language. And there are also some languages that are even in danger of being lost. There may be fewer speakers, the young don't learn the language, or they don't use the language in favor of a more dominant language. And we know in this land, many indigenous communities are working hard to build up their languages, teaching it, using it, talking about it. They understand that language is identity and meaning and place in the world. When we are speakers of a dominant language, I'm doing that right now, we may not realize just how vital language can be. I'd like to tell you my own sort of Pentecost story, and in kind of a roundabout way, it's also about language. How's that for getting at things directly? 
A few years ago, before my time with this congregation, I was privileged to be able to take a sabbatical. Unlike in the academic realm, a sabbatical for clergy is more loosely structured. It may, but it need not necessarily be focused on research. It usually involves some sort of exploration, which leaves much room for exploration. I had been eligible for a sabbatical for some time, but was never quite sure what I wanted to do in that time. And I thought about it and thought more about it, and I realized one thing came to mind was that my own experiences of church were among people who were mostly similar. Most of my experiences of religion were of my own denomination of faith and of faith communities that I would recognize. Most of my understanding of human experience was based on my own experience. So the sabbatical provided me the opportunity to see beyond what I usually see. So in three months' time, which was the length of time of a sabbatical, not a great amount of time, but a wonderful gift, I began to enter worlds that I had never entered. As we're thinking about language today, maybe you can make a connection with courses in language immersion, although not nearly as structured or as prescribed as those would be. So in my time of my sabbatical, I spent time among people who were Hindu. I visited a mosque. I tried out a Buddhist mindfulness practice. I took in the Sikh Vaisakhi Parade. I took online courses in religion and anthropology and poetry. I was meeting people who live their lives out of a different religion and a different spiritual outlook than mine. And I was learning about the human condition, human behaviors, practices, from disciplines, disciplines of study that were new to me. I learned how art, in particular in the form of poetry, shares meaning in ways that are different than the rationalistic ways of expressing communication that I'm most common with. I also took a course in starting Enterprising Sustainable Ministries, something I didn't know anything about. So I said this was about language in a kind of roundabout sort of way. Language is about how we see the world, how we express in faith issues, how we express spirituality, how we live out faith. So one of the biblical stories for Pentecost is about people of the world being scattered. They go off in different directions to learn about the world, to learn about how God is in the world. And the other Pentecost story is about understanding. We have different languages. We have different outlooks. We have different expressions. Maybe we can begin to understand outside of our usual understanding. Maybe the stories for Pentecost tell us that God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will begin to bring out understandings of different people. Maybe with the guiding and the nudging and the pushing of the Holy Spirit, different people will learn from one another and begin to build with one another and work with one another. As we spoke about Pride Month, diverse people begin to see one another, interact with one another, learn from one another, support 
one another. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you show us that we can be curious about ideas, outlooks, and people that we do not know. You show us that we can begin to understand when we did not understand. Draw us, move us, entice us, call us in the ways of ministry and service to a hurting world. Amen. Let us join together singing from Voices, Unim Voices United at number 625, I Feel the Winds of God. We thank you for your continuing support of the mission and the ministry of Trinity United Church and of the United Church of Canada, which you make through offerings and gifts to this congregation and to mission and service. Your gifts of money make a big difference. Thank you. Let us pray. Life-giving spirit, Bring to the bones of these gifts the flesh of our actions and the breath of our caring, that our church and our service to others may come to life in your name. Amen. In response, and as we prepare for the Lord's table, let us sing the refrain of the song in More Voices at 182, Grateful.
I invite you to follow in the order of service for communion, which you should have received with your order of service today. I rem a reminder, a remembrance that this is Christ's table. It's neither mine nor yours, but it's Christ's table who is the host of this meal and feast that we share together. All who seek to follow the ways of Christ, all who seek to follow the ways of justice and peace, compassion and mercy and love in our world are welcome at Christ's table. Today, as we serve communion, we, you will be invited to come forward by the center aisle to the table which is here. There will be servers on either side. They will offer you bread. The bread which you receive is gluten-free. Uh, and then I invite you to take a cup. And when you've partaken of the cup, you may drop in one of the baskets at either side as you go back to your, uh, your place in the pews. And if there's anyone who's not able to come forward, our servers will come to you at the end of the serving time. Let us join in this liturgy together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of light, giver of all life and source of love. You guide the sun and cradle the moon and toss the stars, and at your world, word the world was made, the earth was made, and spun on its course among the planets. You breathe life into us, and you set us among all your creatures in a covenant of love and service. And even when we turn away from you, you do not forsake us. You send your prophets to proclaim your justice, to remind us of your promise of peace, and to call us back to you. Creator, Christ, and Spirit, we praise you for the love revealed to us in Jesus, who walks with us, our wisdom and our way, sharing our joy and our sorrow, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, and setting the captive free. So it is that we join with the song of all creation to proclaim your goodness. Holy, holy, holy God, power of life and love, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna through the ages. Blessed is the one who comes to bring your justice to earth. Hosanna through the ages. Mighty and tender God, in Jesus of Nazareth, we recognize the fullness of your grace, light, life, and love, revealed to us in words that confront and comfort us, in teachings that challenge and change us, in compassion that heals and frees us. And now we gather at this table to remember and to be filled with such longing for your realm that we may rise together to turn our worship into witness and to follow in your ways. And so we remember that when Jesus ate with his friends, he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Each time you do this, remember me. And then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he passed it to his friends, saying, Drink. This cup that is poured out for you is the promise of God made in my blood. Whenever you drink it, remember me. At this time, we remember also all with whom you would have us share your feast. And so we pray for and we remember all who are in sorrow or in pain. We remember and we pray for all who are ill or alone. We 
we remember and we pray for all who live with fear, oppression, or hunger. We remember and we pray for all whom the world counts as last and least, knowing that you count them first and utmost. We pray for the church and its many and varied ministries. We pray for nations as they strive for peace and justice, that they will strive for peace and justice. We pray for our families and our friends, those near and far. Loving God, we rejoice in the gift of your grace. Remembering Christ's life and death, proclaiming his resurrection, waiting in hope for his coming again. Grant that in praise and thanksgiving, we may so offer ourselves to you that our lives may proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Send, O God, your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who share this loaf and this cup may be the body of Christ, light, life, and love in the world. In this hope, and as your people, we praise you, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory is yours, God most holy, now and forever. Let the people say, Amen. Amen. And we pray with Jesus, saying his prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the true vine. All is prepared. I invite you to come. I'll invite those who are serving to come forward first, and, uh, and then we'll invite you forward.
Let us pray. Life-giving God, may we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink this cup bring new life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and all creation will live to praise your name. Amen. Let us join together singing once again from More Voices at number 150, Spirit God Be Our Breath, Him to the Spirit for the Spirit's presence with us. 150. God of power, may the boldness of your Spirit transform us, may the gentleness of your Spirit lead us, may the gifts of your Spirit equip us to serve and worship you now and always. Peace be with you. <laughs> 